Hello. Finishing up the sketch here. Just sort of a impromptu thing that caught my fancy today as a as a concept. I've been doing a lot of Raymark sketches for people's special edition copies of Undying Tales. And one of the one of the requests was for a Cheshire cat. And so I, I sketched a Cheshire cat in the book and then I really liked that sketch. And so I decided to turn it into a painting here, which is what you see in front of me right now. Let me get some painting of this done tonight. Get started on it once I have this base sketch done, which is almost there. Just a few more things. I tried to get it done before I started tonight, but didn't have a chance. Yeah, it's been a while since I did my last Alice in Wonderland theme piece, which is always just a really fun concept to go back to. I think I, I had it on my mind also recently because I've been reading Shannon McGuire's Wayward Children books, which if you haven't read them are really fun and good, but the premise of them is is that it's it's all these kids who have been to various lands. It's, just, it's such a trope in children's literature and, and fantasy in general to have these doorways to other realms open up, you know, like Narnia and down the rabbit hole for Alice. And, and so I just have that on my mind now because I've been reading all those. <laughs> And sorry I wasn't doing any of these videos the past few weeks. It was just so sweltering and hot here because of the smoke that was ongoing. I'm sure you're tired of hearing me talk about that, but <laughs> that's basically been my life. I've, I'm tired of living it. <laughs> Not my life, but living the smoke. Um, yeah, so the, the, the smokiness has been, has been ongoing. And especially these past few Mondays, it was just so hot because I couldn't open any windows. And so I really didn't feel like sitting in front of my desk and, and actually doing anything. So that, that's why I was absent the past few weeks. Fortunately, today we finally seem to be a little bit free of it. Yay. This past week has mostly been pretty nice. I'm really happy about that because I desperately need to get outdoors. Okay, so I think I'm at a good enough spot here. I'm actually going to start doing a little bit of painting, but the first thing I do before I start painting, once I have my pencil sketch, is I just take water on a brush and swipe it over everything that I've just sketched out in pencil. And that helps to make my graphite sort of sink into the page and will make it less likely to just get erased by the passage of my hand as I'm working and painting. And it keeps everything from getting all smudgy and gray as well. That needs just a little moment here to dry off. It wasn't a super soaking wash. 
All right, let me try zooming in a bit more now that I'm going to get started on the painting. <laughs> There's my grinning Cheshire cat. He's got a little Ace of Hearts card in his paw. <laughs> How big is this painting, Eleanor is asking? It is, let's see, I have no idea because it was just a scrap piece of paper I have. It is eight by eight inches. It really was just what I happen to have on hand. And I really have no idea what colors this is going to be. I'm just going to start with painting some pale lemony green tones around the cat because I suspect my background will be some greens of some sort. I have these bunch of ripe fruit over here above his head and these leaves, and there are roses in the lower half, well, lower quarter of the painting. So I, I do want the roses to be red. And I just blend this outward into the surrounding background. It just gives a base wash tone for things to be building up on later. And it, it's not anything that I'm really committed to. I frequently do a yellow or a, a golden toned glaze wash around the perimeter of my main subject. How did I come up with this idea? Jurasu is asking. It was just a Cheshire cat. <laughs> I happened to do a little sketch of a Cheshire cat earlier today and I liked that sketch. It was a uh, it was for it was for um, a remark sketch in a book that someone had purchased and they had requested specifically a Cheshire cat so that's what I'd sketched and I really liked that ink drawing and so I decided to take it into a painting. Samira is asking if I'm a teacher. I don't teach physically in a, in a classroom, although I have done some workshops. I've taught some workshops and I have written several watercolor books. Those are the Dreamscapes books and I do a lot of off the cuff teaching and spreading of my experiences via videos and through my Patreon and stuff. So, sort of, <laughs> is the answer. <laughs> I've done a variety of teaching. So, I, I mean, I guess, yes, I am a teacher, but I just haven't really done it ever in a classroom. What kind of brush am I using? These are handmade brushes from Tracy Lebenzon. And I will put a link to it when I archive this video later. So uh, later on after we finish this, I usually go for about an hour. If you come back to my page and go to the IGTV, I will list links to all the things that I use during the course of the video because I know it's hard for people to catch usually as I'm doing it. Let's see, it's 
But yeah, I, I really like these brushes because they're they're pretty, first of all. <laughs> And they also are very nice for holding because they're super light in bamboo. Okay, the cat. I think I want to make him orange colored. Which paper am I using tonight, Eleanor asks. This is my usual Moulin de Roy. And warning for those of you who have not seen me painting on these Monday sessions, because this gets asked all the time about my paper, but Moulin de Roy is discontinued, so sorry about that. <laughs> but it is the paper that I enjoy the most working on. And it is what I happen to have a lot of because I have stockpiled on it, especially once I found out that it was going to be discontinued. What, so one of the things that's funny about the pose for this cat is that I had been drawing a red panda right before I did the Cheshire Cat. And the, the red panda was almost in this exact same pose and, and I didn't... I wasn't thinking about doing the Cheshire Cat immediately after, but after I sketched that red panda, I was like, oh, that is the perfect lounging position for a fat cat. And so, <laughs> so the, the pose is inspired by that of a red panda lounging in the trees. All the cats around me living in my neighborhood are much more sleek than this. And they don't tend to lounge in the trees. They lounge on my walls. And sometimes on my chairs when I'm trying to sit in them. Gala Guerrero, Guerrero says, loved Mrs. other work. I found it very powerful. It would be amazing if you would paint something about Mexico's traditions someday. I would like to do that someday. I've, I've done some ink sketches and drawings. I did some with monarchs, monarch butterflies last year. Definitely want to explore that some more as well. What would be some of your favorite stories that you would like to see? Again, these are, these are just initial base coats that give uh, something for me to work on, work up on top of with the rendering and the layers of colors as I go. How long does it take me to, from start to finish to complete a work like this, Stina asks. Painting like this, oh, I don't know, maybe 10 to 15 hours, maybe quicker sometimes. It depends on how much detail is in the piece, how much work I put into the background and all the little elements. It really can vary. I mean, it's surprising how much the time investment can really differ from one piece to the next, depending on just how much stuff is going on in the piece. So it's it's always very it's very hard for me to just say a number when someone asks that. <laughs> and and honestly like, you know, a piece of the same size can sometimes can take an hour and then other times, you know, I've done pieces this size just kind of off the cuff uh during these live sessions completely from start to finish and I've, I've just finished a whole piece in that time period in an hour 
Whereas something that is more planned and that has a sketch behind it and has very detailed foreground and background could instead take, as I said, you know, up to 15 hours for a piece this size, which is a moderate, medium, small size piece for me. These days I work up to, well, I guess lately the biggest I've really done is maybe like 16 by 20. I have done larger than that in the past. I've done up to, I think the biggest I've done was 25 by 40 inches for watercolors. I've done bigger with acrylics, although acrylics is not something I've touched in a long time either, in about like 20 years. So you see I leave all these little gaps as I paint for the texture of it because this is the tree trunk here and so I want it to have I want it to have lights and shadowed areas and so by leaving the white of the paper to show through like that that gives me the opportunity for that textured stuff. Yeah, this one, this brush that I'm using currently is Tracy's, let's see, what's it called? It's the, it's a synthetic tip and it is the synthetic brown, which is sort of a medium stiffness. I also like the, the white synthetic stiff ones that he's got. People sometimes get impatient with watercolor drying, although it's a lot faster than acrylics and oils. <laughs> uh, I, I don't ever, it doesn't ever really bother me, the drying time. I, I never use hair dryers, which is something that I know some artists use to hasten the drying. For me, I just, I just move around to different portions of a painting. If something is currently wet, then there's plenty of other areas for me to continue working on. For example, you know, the, the cat was wet before, and so I switched to doing the tree trunk. And you know, now these areas are all wet, so I'm not I'm not bothering to do the plants and things over there yet. I'm going to go back to the cat in just a second. But there's room to maneuver around and jump around from one portion of a painting to the other so that you don't ever really have to pause in your work. You just kind of shift to an area that isn't getting any attention at the moment. Now this doesn't work when you do a large wash that might cover a broad area of your painting. You know, some of the demos that I, I do, uh, that, that I have videos for, you know, I, I have to wait an hour between layers drying in the background, but those are the ones where I'm just spreading paint across the whole background and lots of water and I need to let things sit and dry on in their own time so that granulation can happen and do its wonderful thing. So it looks like my tree trunk is taking on a decidedly mossy hue. 
As I said, I had no plans initially, but that's that's what it's turning out to be now. It's a very green, moss-covered color to everything. Let's see, Gala Guero. Guero, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing it wrong. <laughs> uh, here we have lots of stories and legends about animals as the bird and deer, also about pre-Hispanic gods and creatures that I think they'd look really amazing painted by you, like Quetzalcoatl or Itchel, goddess of the moon, and Tlaloc, god of the water. Yeah, I'll definitely look into, look into those some more. I painted some of those legends with the animals involved. So if you if you look at my Undying Tales from last year, there are actually a number of those legends that I uh, dove into with those pieces, and I had a lot of fun with them. And I think there should be a few in this year's Undying Tales too. So I'm going to start on that in October which is right around the corner now. It's a lot sooner than it felt like it was going to be. <laughs> and if you haven't checked out my Undying Tales list, it's a set of um, endangered creatures from around the world as, long as, as well as stories, the folklore and mythology that it, that surrounds these creatures and so it's a prompt list for October and you're welcome to join in if you'd like. Last year it was really fun to see what everyone was creating from the stories and legends that I had gathered together for that and I'd love to see more this year. So if you if you look to hashtag Undying Tales Project you can find the list for that and it's also in my feed in my Instagram feed. What paint is the dark mossy green that I'm using, Eleanor? It is predominantly Aquarius green, but I'm also mixing in some Van Dyke brown, which is Daniel Smith's, I think. Yes, it's my Daniel Smith Van Dyke brown here. So the two of those is creating this very earthy green that has some nice granulation in it because of the Roman Sesmol's Aquarius green. saying finally I can watch your live drawing again. Yeah, sorry I was I was absent for a few weeks because the smoke and heat was just too much for me to sit at my desk. But I am back now. So I'm, I'm taking a golden orangey color and sort of just dry brushing these short little strokes along how the fur would be. To get that fur texture. But also I'm gonna do some more shading right over here. under that fuzzy chest. <laughs> that fuzzy red panda inspired chest. <laughs> so sort of working 
back and forth with the foreground, so the cat here, and the area, I hesitate, hesitate to say background because the tree still feels a little foregroundy also, um, but you know, the tree area at the same time helps to keep the two integrated so that I, I don't end up with a cut and paste feeling to the cat being on the tree here. And I keep this paper here under my hand so that I don't get too smeary with either the undried paint or with the pencil. Although, as I, as I showed you earlier when I just did that brushing of water across the whole surface, that should serve to keep the pencil from getting too smeary in the first place. As always, if any of you have random questions that are unrelated to the painting here, feel free to ask them. I'm happy to talk about anything here. <laughs> A little bit of lifting because the greens got too dark around the edges of that card, and I don't want to have an outline on the card. So I just take some water with an older brush and I lift it out. And it does so very easily on this paper. Now here, I just, you know how I mentioned that I, I let the, a lot of the white stick out through the areas of my initial green mossy glaze. So this is where I, I use those and emphasize them and shade them and turn them into bark highlight. How long have I been painting? Ridolent Quill asks. I have been, well, I've been doing art all my life. I've always loved drawing and painting from as early as I can remember. That's one of, I mean, it's one of the earliest things that I can remember is people asking me, what do you want to do when you grow up? And, and saying, I want to be an artist. <laughs> And so I've always, I've always drawn and painted and I took lots of, um, I took, I did take classes when I was younger, you know, just art classes and they, they were very generalized though. And really it was more, you know, a space for a kid to just really learn to love art and love creating. It wasn't really a whole lot of technique in the, those kinds of places, but I started to do some acrylic when I was in high school and then in college that was pretty much when I was when I was doing art there uh, watercolor was not an option it was highly discouraged to use watercolor because it was seen as quote the tools of an illustrator <laughs> Never mind that I wanted to become an illustrator. <laughs> uh, so I, I did a lot of acrylic then. I, I did at one point play with oils, but I've never seriously done it because I've, I've never had a big enough and dedicated studio space to do oils and I, I don't really want to do it in a 
smaller place that doesn't have enough ventilation. But I picked up watercolors in, oh, that was about 1998 was when I really first looked on watercolors as a potential for any sort of serious artwork that I wanted to create. Because, you know, prior to that, I, I was told to stay away from it. And, and I thought that watercolors could only produce hazy landscapes and things. And it was, that wasn't what I wanted to create either. And so in 1998, though, I started using watercolors for the first time trying to create the kinds of things that I had in my head and I, I fell in love with it then. I, I started with just a piece or two and it quickly became my favorite medium to work with. And at the time I was doing I was doing digital art and I was doing acrylic and the way I was painting with acrylics though, I was, I was doing many layers and building them up in glazes, which I realized at some point, oh, I should try watercolors because I think that this is a technique that is more suited to watercolors than it is to acrylics, even though I know, knew nothing, knew very little about watercolors. So I went to the went to the store and I bought my first set. It was the student grade of Winsor Newton Cotman's. Yeah, that's what they're called. Um, and I I did one painting. My first piece that I did with that set, I, I limited myself to just two colors. I just used green and purple. It was sort of an exercise that my art teacher, my art professor, had had us do at some point. One of the very, very few technique-based things that they had had us try, <laughs> which was to recreate a painting. The, the, the assignment that I did, I'm talking about, the assignment was to recreate a painting, a historical painting, using just two colors, using two complementary opposite of the color wheel colors. So they would be like yellow and purple or blue and orange and red and green. So opposite colors plus black and white. And those were the only pigments we were allowed to use in the recreation. And it's surprising how many shades and colors you can actually create using just two opposing colors on a color wheel. And so it was a, it was really neat. It was a neat uh, exercise to do. So I had that in mind when I did that first watercolor painting, I, instead of doing opposite colors though, because my goal wasn't to recreate the whole range of colors. My goal was to create a mood in the piece, but limiting myself so that I didn't have so many things to worry about all at once, seeing as that was first time I was doing anything with watercolors that weren't Crayola <laughs> and I I just fell in love with the way the paint flowed and how the piece turned out and just I loved it and so that was kind of the start of me working with watercolors and from there on I just started doing more and more with watercolors and I, I pretty much stopped doing acrylic. I was doing some digital still because that was, at that point I was starting, I had, I had started to do some contract work for various game companies. And, and, and uh, so at that stage, I already had some clients that were asking me for work and mostly that was digital. And so I still had to, stick it out with my commitments and with people who were coming to me looking for looking for work from me and looking at my existing portfolio and saying you know we want we want work like that and so 
at that point it was it was digital and so I had to I had to do it digital for a while a little while longer but I gradually began to shift away from that to doing more and more watercolor and over time you know at first it was it was clients that were asking me to do the digital artwork but then over time it was clients coming to me saying specifically we want your watercolor work which was really a big turning point for me and it was sort of when I realized that I could pursue my own vision and create what I wanted to create and have have an audience for that it was really an eye-opening thing to me because prior to that point I was really trying to cram myself into a box to fit what I thought the publishing industry wanted and even even to cram myself into the publishing industry was a, was fitting myself into a box because I didn't know of any other way to be able to pursue art as a living other than doing it for publishing because that was all that I saw as being available out there uh, for for artists you know that was the reason that was the reason why everyone up until that point was telling me yeah don't 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 be an artist because you're just gonna starve <laughs> so, so don't even bother trying to do that because it's pointless and I believed them at first I believed them for 15 years before I got to that point where I was on my own for the first time and realizing that, you know what, I don't care if I believe them because if I do, I'm going to be miserable and so I just have to make art work somehow for me. And, and that, was, that was when I really dove into it and really tried to carve my own niche Wondertide says, if I use techniques f that I learned from you, what makes it so that my paintings aren't copying you? Trees are my main focus. Well, if you, if you look to the building blocks of what I show in my, in my videos and in my guides and, and in my books, those are applicable to anyone and it's, it's going to take on the flavor of you if you practice them and learn to find what elements speak to you and, and what what helps you to bring your own visions into being. So, you know, art, some, sometimes I, I get people, I've, I've had someone uh, complain that what I was showing, like I was, I wasn't showing the secret, the secret technique, like the secret missing thing that was going to make their art happen. Like I was holding back was, was the accusation. And, and I didn't know how to tell them. It's like, no, I'm not holding back anything. It's like this, the secret is just doing a lot of it. And the secret is really all these basic elements and just learning and really taking them into yourself and turning them then into your own tools. So, yeah, so I, I think that if, if you do follow any artists and if you're learning, then yeah, in the beginning it's always, you are going to look a little bit like that artist because at that point you haven't yet internalized those tools and internalized the methods and things. But once you do bring them into yourself, then it starts to have your own flavor and it starts to have your own style. And, and you'll see that happen. You, you can't force it. It's just the same way you can't force your style. You can't, you can't carve out a style for yourself. Things like that, they happen over time because you become practiced and because the techniques and the way of moving paint just becomes a part of your, your visual repertoire and, and you can just you know, produce that onto a paper. Anyway, I hope that's, I hope that's a useful answer. <laughs> uh, 
Oh yeah, so I was, I was saying about how when I, when, when publishers first started then coming to me asking for me to create things in my watercolor style, you know, that was a real eye-opening, uh, eye-opening thing for me because that was when I then realized, okay, it's time to stop trying to cram myself into a mode of creating for other people's visions and and to really listen to my own instincts and to create the kind of art that I want to create because that was getting a better reception anyway. <laughs> so, you know, it's it's when I learned that that trying to create things to make other people happy isn't going to make them happy because it it isn't then what my own voice is and it's it's not going to ring authentic in the imagery and in, in the in the creation so it's a hard thing to remember all the time and even now i always have to remind myself of that you know create for myself create in a way that is authentic to what I want to envision and don't worry about what people think about it because when you worry about that then you create lesser art you create things that aren't as good as you can make it Kim Tran says, have I ever used those water brush on colored ink? Um, can you elaborate on that question? Do you mean, have I used these specific brushes on colored inks? Or do you mean, have I just ever painted with color, colored inks at all? switch now to a really tiny size zero brush. So the size zero is sable. And if you're wanting to know the brand, unfortunately this is another one of those that is discontinued so it won't do any good. <laughs> I feel like I'm constantly chasing after art supply, you know, a new tool that I really, really enjoy using and, and like, and then just as I start to really appreciate it, it gets discontinued <laughs> over and over again. That's the story. Am I using Daniel Smith watercolors at the moment? This is in a soul. I am using a mixture of a number of different brands, primarily Daniel Smith, yes. There is also a few Winsor Newton, a few Renaissance. The mossy green color that I had down here is Roman Sesmol. So I use a number of brands, but the m majority of my colors here are Daniel Smith. Have I brushed over a colored ink sketch before? No, I have not. I don't really mingle watercolors with my inking. I've only ever kept them separate. I do like using ink brush pens, but those are, as I say, I've only kept them separate with ink drawings and I haven't really ever done any mingling of watercolor and ink. I think primarily because I like 
having the nebulous soft edges of watercolors and when I'm working with ink I, I go for a different look and, and so I haven't really ever mixed those. Yeah, the orange that I'm using for this cat is primarily quinquedrone deep gold. See, do you do you when getting down sketches for possible paintings do you have any suggestions I am currently having a difficult time with it uh, I think you uh, uh, I don't know if you can rephrase your question also but I'll, I'll answer what I think you're asking which is uh, how do I get ideas for sketches so I constantly keep a sketchbook going with any random ideas that might spring to mind at any time. And I'll just scribble down a, a little thumbnail sketch whenever that happens, just so that I have it there for using when times are lean and when I'm sort of struggling to find ideas. You know, I have then a sketchbook to refer to and find something that maybe I overlooked at the time and can turn into a painting. And then the other suggestion I would have is to always just be prepared to just play around and doodle, doodle and sketch. And that's, that's kind of the best way to keep the creative energy high. And you don't have to take it seriously. Just, you know, if you're just sitting, sitting down and you got nothing else to do, start doodling something. Uh, I've been I've been doing a lot of doodles the past week because I am doing a lot of Raymark sketches for the people that ordered special edition of my new book, Undying Tales. But one of the things that I find when doing these sketches, because I, I do so much of them all at once, you know, I'm doing like 20 of them per day right now. <laughs> is that I get lots of ideas from just the sheer volume of these little sketches and drawings. In fact, this Cheshire cat here is the result of one of those sketches. Here, let me pull out that sketch and you can see it. Give me a moment. background here. Sorry, I'll be right back. Okay, so here is the Cheshire Cat that I drew. And so after doing this drawing, I decided that I really wanted to paint it. And so that's what's happening over here now. But Getting ideas a lot of times is it's just about doing enough art and just like doing enough stuff that that something sticks and something inspires you and and calls out to to be made into you know something more. So just play around and doodle and sketch is my biggest suggestion. And don't take don't don't put too much pressure on yourself. Don't say like, I have to come up with an idea when I'm doing this. Because if you do that, if you, if you put a lot of weight on yourself, then every sketch that you do becomes precious. And then if it doesn't meet your expectations, then there's frustration. And then that just leads to, you know, getting stuck. <laughs> So just remember to enjoy 
art and to just enjoy the creative process. And if you don't think about it too much, then the inspiration and ideas will come to you. At least that's how I've always experienced it. Uh, I had, I had a tough time in the first few years when, uh, after my daughter was born, because I was used to my time constantly being my own and to be able to make, sit down and paint and to do art on my own schedule. And so having to rein that in and have limited hours when I was able to create was really tough for me at first on my creativity because I, I couldn't, I couldn't uh, focus in these very short spans of time that were not under my own um, expectations of, you know, when I could create. And, and so as a result, I started to get very precious about my time and my painting and, and wanting every second to matter and wanting every piece that I created to be the next masterpiece. And all that did, all that expectation did was just to make it even harder. And I found myself just really tightening up and, and not able to come up with any ideas that that were satisfying to me. It just became so frustrating to create. And it wasn't until I realized that I had to just let go and not demand of myself that every time I sit down, I was going to make a masterpiece. You know, every time I sit down, all it meant was that I'm going to sit down and I'm going to make, I'm going to do some art and I'm just going to enjoy it. And that's all that matters. And if I could accomplish that, then I was suddenly getting ideas again, and I was suddenly able to create again. So learning to let go of this idea that every piece has to matter, you know, that was kind of the most important lesson for me to learn from that. And it has, you know, served me well. She's, she's 10 years old now, but um, I feel like it has given me a healthier relationship with my art making and my creating to view things like that and to remember to constantly play with my art and to always remember that the reason I'm doing this art is because I love it and I love all the time spent with it. I don't do it because I have to craft a masterpiece. I'm doing it because I just love the creative process. black little tips on his ears. Mm, drawing down more says, I think I really need to hear that. Thank you. And in a soul says, awesome advice. Thank you. You're welcome. And I hope it helps you also. It's, it, it definitely is something that I still always wrangle with, and it's something that I always have to remind myself about when I start getting too precious about my time at the desk. To always pull back and try to remember that stuff.
big shiny white grin. <laughs> he was looking very satisfied with himself. Did I pre-stretch the paper before taping it down to the board? No, I do not. I don't ever bother with pre-stretching. Uh, the paper I am using, though, is 300 pounds, so it is fairly heavyweight. But even using uh, 140 pound, I, I don't ever bother stretching. And sometimes with the really liquid heavy techniques that I use, I employ, the 140 pound does buckle a tiny bit, but as long as you keep it taped down, it's not too big of a deal. And if there is serious buckling that happens, what you can do is when you're done with the painting, you spray it with some water on the backside and then you sandwich it between something waterproof. I usually use a couple pieces of glass because I always have a lot of those uh, discarded from picture frames since I always replace the glass with plexi. <laughs> um, but I uh, then sandwich it underneath some books and let it dry again. You have to be really careful not, don't spray it too much though. You don't want your painting to run or for things to get too soggy. So just very, very lightly. And then you just leave it overnight or something and that flattens it out as well. Am I prepared for Inktober, Fireblood says. I do my own thing in October as of last year. Last year I, I started my own hashtag, which is Undying Tales. Uh, Undying Tales Project is what it got switched to this year. But it is a prompt list featuring endangered creatures as well as the mythology and folklore that surround these creatures from all around the world. And you can find that at undyingtales.com. You can also see it in my Instagram uh, feed. Just scroll back a little bit. I'll, I'll post I'll post the challenge list again if anyone missed it the first time. But I am looking forward to that. I, I started that last year and it was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed watching and seeing what other people were creating as well. Am I standing or sitting? I am sitting. I've always sat to do my art. So I keep layering different colors here into the shadows to build them up darker and darker. Some, some of those layers were glazes of orange that kind of reflect the, the cat's colors and others are darker greens and then sometimes for the deepest parts, I, I do a little bit of Payne's Gray to really pull those deep crevices of the shadows down. I think that we are coming down to the end of our time. I usually go for about an hour with these sessions and most, most Mondays they happen. I miss the last three weeks or so because, because of smoke and heat. 
hopefully I'm back on schedule again so that the next session will be September 28th at 6 p.m. Pacific time. So come and join me again next week. I might might do another impromptu session at some point this week for this painting, but I don't have any planned time for that, so I can't tell you when exactly. But yes, Mondays at 6 p.m. Pacific. And thank you so much, everyone, for joining me tonight. I will list out the tools and things and the links for the stuff that I've used this evening. So if you have any questions about those, please check in my IGTV log later after I have a chance to upload this all. And you should find the links for things there. But thanks for joining me, and thanks for watching this happy Cheshire cat slowly come into being, and I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks, and good night.